My name is Georgette King. I'm Melissa Turner, and uh, Georgette is a colleague and friend, and uh, we work together on a number of projects involving community uh, engagement and outreach. So, Melissa, how did you get involved doing um, community engagement work, and what made you interested in doing that work with, um, particularly with HIV? I was a social worker at an HIV treatment program in Washington, D.C., and, um, you know, in the 1980s, when I came into HIV as a very, very young, naive social worker, new to Washington and new to HIV, it was a very dark time. It was a very mm -hmm. dark time. It was, um, it was AZT or nothing. And so there was a lot of death and suffering and loss. And um, I was overwhelmed with it. I was overwhelmed with it. And so I was um, part of the community of uh, people serving and um, supporting those living with <laughs> HIV. Um, which at that point in time was very separate from clinical trials and very separate from research. And um, working at DC General, this was the only public hospital in Washington. This was serving the poorest of the poor and the sickest of the sick. But I came from a community perspective because I was one of those who was um, uh, ignorant about research, afraid of it. Um, I believed every myth I thought it was wrong and scary. So <laughs> I've come oh, a long wow. ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've come a long ways. Yeah. And um, again, it was AZT or nothing. And there was this one guy, this one patient, who um, he couldn't tolerate the AZT at all. And he was a person who wanted some kind of treatment. He wanted to feel like he could do something. And he was very sick. He was very thin. He was very wasted. And he couldn't tolerate even one AZT pill. But he was eligible for a research trial. And that research trial was DDI versus DDC. These are some early, early drugs. And he said to me, you know, what do you think about that? Do you think I should, you think I should go into this study? And I was just overwhelmed with a sense of dread about research. I didn't understand it. Um, I was very, very ignorant about it. But it was his asking me, a patient that I really cared about and wanted to help, and who clearly wanted treatment, him asking me, my opinion, <laughs> that forced me to um, educate myself, to find out some information. And that was really my entree into um, learning about clinical research. Mm -hmm. That's how I learned, by helping him to learn. And um, he did go on that study. You know, he was randomized in that study. And, um, I watched him get, I can't say he got better, but he got worse more slowly. It slowed down the disease progression. And I noticed that, it wasn't lost on me. And the value of that trial, that drug, buying him some time before he died, because he did eventually die, um, was a lesson to me. It was a lesson to me, because it taught me that had, you, had he allowed his fear, had I allowed my fear, if you allow fear, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, misinformation um, to drive you, it would have robbed him of that extra time that that study provided to him. And it taught me that, um, that progress moves slowly. Even in research, progress moves slowly because it didn't save him. It didn't save him, but it did buy him some time. I had a similar experience. I was doing, um, I began doing work around HIV as a buddy volunteer. Oh, yeah. A buddy volunteer was someone, at the time that I began doing the work, was really there to um, be a support person from some, for someone who was dying of AIDS. That was really my job. Yeah. But there was, we were still at the time where HIV was considered to be a gay white male disease, and here I am being paired with woman after woman in a community that had a very small black population. I was very surprised um, to find so many women 
who were living, well, who were dying of AIDS. Uh, by the time I start partnering with them, doing the buddy work with them, they were all at that point where they were in the wasting syndrome. It was a time before there was a cocktail, so there really wasn't treatment, and the progression was expected to be towards death at that point. I, I mean, I understood early on, and it sounds like you did too, and I guess I was annoyed with the separation of research yeah. from all of these other support services for people living with HIV. Mm -hmm. And I felt that it was just as critical for people to know, understand their research options as they understood where they could get food, where they could get help to pay their rent, where they could get transportation, where they could get medicine and see a doctor. I felt like research ought to be integrated as a resource not that everybody needs to participate, but as a resource that, they, that, that folks living with HIV needed to understand what their options were across the board and what the resource, what help was out there yeah. to assist them. I, I agree, and I think part of the biggest element of that, because there's only a limited number of people who will ever become research volunteers, right. and that's a very important group, and we need to keep talking to people about why that's important, but even larger than that is being able to access the information that comes out of research. This is really interesting because there's so many parallels in our story because um, maybe just a, three or four years ago I pursued a master's in public administration because of those same issues. I just wanted mm -hmm. to understand better how public policies were created and how we could create a bridge between the science driving public policy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and all of that speaks to our work with community engagement because I want to help people up to understand how um, these things come together and how um, it's important to allow or advocate for public policy to uh, be created out of real facts, mm -hmm. real information, real outcomes, real well-designed studies and results and not be driven by our fears or our attitudes or by stigma. And again, this is, you know, this is all related to our community engagement because I want I work to try to open up a dialogue and a conversation with people uh, at the point where they are. You mm -hmm. know, what do you know about HIV? What are you interested in knowing more about? What are the things that you always wanted to know and never had someone to ask? When a right. patient walks in my door after seeing the doctor and a nurse and being checked in and having blood drawn, I tend to be sort of at the end of the conversation. What's left undone for you? What do, what, do, what do we need to uh, explain? What are your questions? Uh, what was done well? What was done poorly? Where are you at at this point? And try to start from there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important too. Yeah. yeah. When I'm doing community engagement work for um, HPTN, yeah. that has to be the basis. And, you know, like we've talked about, the folks who have that ability to help. Um, spread the word about the importance of biomedical prevention research are often the folks who are doing that real frontline work. So they're yeah. putting out fires every day. They're dealing with their clients who can't get housing, they can't get food, they can't get those issues. Mm -hmm. But again, we need them to understand what advancements have been made in research, but we also need them to understand their role. Mm -hmm. So it's not going out and talking about community engagement and ever confusing that with, we want you to volunteer to be a part of a study. Mm -hmm. That's not what community engagement is. Mm -hmm. It's really understanding your role. So is your role in community engagement helping to spread information about what has happened through research? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think engagement along that whole spectrum is very, very important. And that's one of the challenges, though, because very often folks still haven't unpacked their own issues around why they distrust research, mm -hmm. why they don't believe 
that things have really moved forward. So they're still giving advice within the community that's really the exact opposite of what may be in the best interest of their own clients, only because they don't know what's happened next. And I think that's our responsibility, is to make sure people understand what the advancements have been and how this applies in their everyday life. And then as a result of that, there's a decrease in stigma and distrust around research. So I think getting people involved as research volunteers is a natural end result of that. But it can't start with recruitment. Recruitment has to be the end product mm -hmm. um, and a possible end product. Well, I do think we're making progress. Yeah. I believe that we're making progress. I, I just feel optimistic about the future. And um, I do think the science over time has become better. I think mm -hmm. it's more accessible. And I think that's because of uh, including community members in all phases. I completely agree. I think it's the diversity of interest and pushing that's really become very important. You know, it's not a matter of saying, well, it's uh, the researchers don't necessarily look like us anymore, because increasingly they do. So hearing that change in diversity, um, seeing uh, more women involved in that process, and seeing there being this huge expansion of the voices that are coming to the table has been hugely important. And the researchers, I think, understand, I know that they understand, that it's not going to just be a matter of going into a community and saying, you know, here's what we're here to do for you and with mm -hmm. you and to you, but saying we really need your input. We need you to be um, a strong force in helping to develop this. And um, I'm optimistic that as long as that continues, I'm optimistic. Well, thank you, Melissa. I enjoyed talking to you. This has been fun. Thank you.